Welcome to a fun collaborative edition of Multifamily Strategy Live with the Business Brotherhood Live. We're going live on both channels today. So for those of you who don't already follow the uh, business channel that Caleb and I often collaborate on, but on Caleb's business channel, go ahead and check that out. Give it a follow. Watch live there. Today, we're talking about something that is directly collaborative between both of our channels, which is closing the deal. We've done some business. Uh, both of us have had some business ventures. Both of us have real estate ventures. We're talking about essentially sales, negotiations, closing the deal. I think there's going to be a lot of crossover here. So very excited to get rolling. Caleb, welcome back to the channel. And for Caleb's like channel. It's been forever. Look at me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm never on here. There we go. Okay. Well, welcome to a double streamed edition. I think we're also... Uh, you know, blasting out to Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all the other places you can stream. It's so. not called Twitter. I, I'm, it's not called Twitter, but that's yeah, okay. it's just weird to say it's blasting out to X. It's they, they it still goes Twitter.com still goes the same place. Whatever. We're everywhere. We're on LinkedIn. We're on Facebook. We're on X. We're on YouTube. We're on Instagram. Wherever you want to stream. But if you want the most engagement, hop over to YouTube. Those are the easiest to read. Post your comments there, and we will get. Rolling before we start, we already have a question for Caleb, so we'll launch that and we'll give some context here. Caleb, how many units are you at today? I am at 53 units owned and I'm under contract on another 26 units right now, looking to close middle of next month. Dude, super exciting. So that's like what? You're, you're 20-ish days out from uh, from close on Just about. Yeah, just about. Dude, that's a big deal. It's not bad. Yeah. Well, huge congratulations. We're going to talk about some of our deals, both in business and in real estate. We're going to talk about sales negotiating for this. We're not going to answer as many questions in the chat that are direct about real estate because this is talking about sales negotiation. We're going to stay on topic today for the most part, but excited for a surprise bonus broadcast. Caleb, talk to me about uh, the number of deals you've done. Let, let's start with total number. Uh, how many deals in real estate have you closed? Yeah, so this would be my fifth deal in real estate closing right now. So far, closed out and done. I've done four previously. Perfect. Financing on those, uh, how many seller financed, how many bank financed? Um, up to this point, it's been all seller finance. This fifth one is a bank finance deal, though. So I'm doing something new for the fifth one. There we go. Someone's found a way to qualify. Well done. Congratulations, man. That is, a, that is a huge deal. <laughs> uh, in business, what does your business portfolio look like right now? So you got you got your real estate arm. What else do you do? Yeah, so I have the real estate arm, and then I have kind of the social media um, sales company. Um, kind of just, that's kind of the second arm of my life. So it's basically real estate and sales. It's kind of takes up most of my time. Awesome. All my portfolio businesses are based around the main thing, which is the real estate. But I own a property management company. I I'm very actively engaged in the marketing arm of my companies. Uh, so I, I kind of like unofficially have a marketing company, I suppose. And then we have... I eventually will probably create one. I've, I've thought about that. Sales and That'll make sense of, with your systems. Is, if you want to really save powerful. time, acquire one. Acquire one. Uh, I have to figure out how. <laughs> oh, there we go. Well, we'll talk about that today. And then we'll do... Um, what's the last one I have? Oh, yeah. Multifamily strategy. The, uh, the, the best place to learn how to buy a deal with or without money. We do some creative, which is what we're known for. We also can just conventionally knock out deals. So very excited. Caleb, okay, let's talk a little bit about your business. So people have context. And we're going to chop it up with the deals that we have done and lessons learned. Uh, Caleb, what do you sell? Yeah, basically, I'm plugging in the influencers, sales funnels. Like you're one of my clients. I've got some other clients I have right now at the same time. So it's basically looking to help you guys grow your brands. It's kind of the biggest, like boil it down to level one. That's essentially what the company does. 
Caleb's company will essentially take over the the inbound and some of the outbound messaging, but they are basically lead closers. They let the person who's selling the product, especially in the digital product space, focus on their business, let all the funnels go flow into Caleb's company. They close and they charge no upfront fees. Excellent model, super effective company to work with. Uh, very impressed with what you built. Based on your revenue, I don't know if you know this answer, but what do you know what the value of your company is today? If you had to get a valuation with your current income? I mean, I mean, we're going three at like three to four X kind of somewhere in there. I mean, I'm sitting, um, gosh, anywhere from six to seven fifty, depending how you value it. There we go. So on your way to building your first million dollar company, where are you going to be at at the end of the year? Uh, at the end of the year, I got to be at least worth the company's got to be at least worth three million dollars. <laughs> okay, you got some work cut out. You're gonna you're gonna what? That's about a four x of uh four to five x. Yeah. Okay. There we go. All right. Let's talk. Uh, let's talk sales pro uh, process because there's three main pieces of every sale, and different people have different skill sets in there. Uh, Caleb has different skills than I do. I've worked with him on a bunch of projects. But uh, you have the open, you have the negotiation, you have the close. I mean, if you're going to break it down to the three main things, we're going to call them right there. Open is where Caleb really thrives. I think Caleb's very good at opening opportunities. Caleb, what things about your personality and what piece of advice do you have on being an effective opener? When you come to, if this is a sales transaction, a real estate transaction, it's all the same. Yeah, I mean, I think um, being a great opener is why I'm decently proficient at raising capital and getting deals as well i mean i for one i can't shut up never have been able to never will be able to so building relationships is about the easiest thing to do in the world and that relationships whether it's a say it's relationship through sales if it's relationship raising capital if it's relationship with an owner it kind of all boils down to that it's just being personal being transparent and not trying to fake it i mean with everything it's like i don't swear anymore but i used to swear like a sailor um just talk how i talk i don't hold punches i'm not playing cloak and dagger games it's just being transparent showing who i am what i'm working on is pretty much how opening is easy for me there we go and i found that whenever you're building a new relationship especially when you start talking transaction the main thing is you end up doing less of the talking you need to be really which is hard for me <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's hard for me too. I'm also an over talker, which is why we have uh, so much time on YouTube because I just get to talk. In a transaction, you really want to communicate who you are, what the general framework is. You want to have in the first like very few seconds. So you start, you know, in a meeting, you're going to start with some amount of small talk. You get comfortable. As soon as you get down, I always start with the verbal agenda. Like, okay, well, dude, super good to see you. Glad we're meeting. Here's pretty much what I wanted to go over today. And it will be X and Y. That way there's no ambiguity. People aren't waiting for the other shoe to drop. It's just like, okay, this is what we're talking about. Uh, I had a couple thoughts. Get your thoughts out there. Get the ball rolling. Pass it on to them. 80-20 rule is a fantastic place to get into the negotiations. Negotiation, whoever talks less, I think generally wins negotiation. I think you that can be the case, yeah. And then piggybacking what you said, I don't think it's an exact science for 80-20. And like people out yep. there listening, it's not, it's not like... Hey, I'm going to say five words and I'm going to say, let's get to business. It's like, sometimes you have something to catch up on. Like whether it's like, like if, it, if I meet with an owner here, it's like, Hey, like I'm talking about how, how his kid's doing, how all that stuff's going. There might be a few points we hit, but it's not like forced. You're building relationships regardless. Like I think that's where a lot of people get the misconception is like, Oh, it's all like science. I can write it down on paper. It's like, there's a little bit more personal aspect to that. It's not just, Oh, plug in number one, two, three, four, then talk, then shut up. It's like, no, you're just, having a conversation with someone. Yep. It's supposed to be conversational and you want to do a majority of the listening. And that's, that's the purpose of the A20 rule. It's just like, am I doing a significant amount more listening than I am talking? What you Agreed. find is when you get to the negotiation phase, most people will give you all the pieces you need to close the deal. If you ask great discovery questions and you just listen. So discovery questions are going to be, uh, let, let's talk real estate transactions. So I think that's going to be relatable to pretty much everyone who's going to listen to our channels. When you're talking real estate transaction, you want to know their motivation. You want to know the price. You want to know if it's seller financeable, how, how we're taking it out. You want to get all these pieces. If you offer too much, now they know what they can get from you. It basically they have your cards. I, I yeah, want to do a great job of listening and being authentic. And I want to hit all their goals, but I would like them to set up the goalpost before we go out and play the game, especially if they're on the selling end. I just want to know what's out there. So basic questions like, all right, like how's the property treated you? 
what has gone well? What things are you going to improve next? Basic questions. You're, you're considering selling now. What's changed? What do you want to do after you sell the property? These are all things to know. Caleb, on, I, I'm going to guess Caleb's done a good job of documenting a good deal of those. Even though you're working through a broker, uh, you're buying a 26 unit right now. Have you mapped the motivation of the seller? I mean, yeah, it's pretty basic. The seller is a local developer here in town. He wants to go build more stuff. He okay. is a very absentee owner, you could say. Uh, property managers here um, still understand where the rents could be sometimes, which is just like, that's a big value add. So it's basically understanding, hey, his motivation is to go build something else, understanding where the opportunity is and piggybacking on what you're talking about through conversation, asking questions. It is super important to be an active listener throughout this whole process. It's you're nodding, you're agreeing, you're validating what they're saying, whether it's like over text, over the phone, in person. It's all different, but being an active listener is a key part of all of it, no matter how you're talking to them. Yep. And there you go. So so right there, when we go into negotiations, I've heard most of what I need to hear. So probably not going to be seller finance because they want to take the money and develop. So they're looking for a cash out event. That means we, exactly. we're going to have to win on price, right? Like right up front, we know we have to win on price. And that, that was what I saw immediately. I mean, I've been going back on this thing for about a month and a half, figuring out how to get creative. And then I kind of just started like kind of digging my heels in with the price a little bit. And I was like, okay, we're not going to be able to get creative here. It's going to have to be priced. This thing's going to have to come down a little bit. Um, so just dug my heels and was like, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what I can do. And the seller wants to sell. And then boom, under contract and closing in 20 days. That's kind of just how the process went. Wasn't super fast. It's not always going to be super fast. Sometimes it will be like my 25 unit. But you have to understand what you're playing with. If it was like, hey, I kind of want a whole, like, I don't mind the monthly payments, all this stuff, it's going to immediately sell our finance. You like the income, immediately sell our finance. But if they're like, yeah, I kind of want the cash. And if they have a very specific reason for wanting that cash, then you're probably going to be looking at a cash out of it. Yep. And so then you just write the deal to that. You're like, okay, well, here's what the price is going to have to be. In this case, you have a deal in that town, 25 units that you paid 80000 a door for. You know that was a stellar deal. So I, I'm going to guess that you came in on a price less than 80000 a door. Yeah, about 60000 a door, closer to sixty than eighty. And we know in this town, one bed's 100 to 110 valuation is pretty darn common, which means you're winning by about $40,000 per unit on price. I'm going to say that's going to be a stellar deal. Uh, okay, so you proposed your terms. They got accepted. What? What did the the did you just put together a proposal and they just said yes? I mean, is that is that how that piece? It was a or? it was a lot of back and forth, right? I mean, we were like, I was originally wanting to get creative, like trying mm -hmm. to understand what their note note was, like all this like crazy creative stuff, like all this stuff seemed to be assumed, all this stuff wasn't really looking to subject to on this one, not really part of my wheelhouse. But yeah, we basically just trying to figure it out, break it down, uh, found out their pieces, and eventually it kind of just got to the point where it's like, okay, this thing's getting serious. I have the opportunity to put this thing under contract. I don't know where the financing's come from. I don't know where my money's coming from, but I have a deal. And it's not, you don't have a deal until you have it under contract. So I just threw it under contract and got the rest figured out from there. There we go. And now we get to the fun part of the sale. You close the deal. So in real estate, there's a bigger lag between negotiation and close. And there are a lot of things. You have a ton of due diligence, but even when you're buying a business, it looks fairly similar. So mm -hmm. we go through, uh, what does due diligence look like for you on this particular deal? This 26 unit. I mean, right. I mean, you were down here on my birthday. I got to walk the property, which is a super cool birthday present. So walking the property, looking over all the financials for the bank, you add an extra layer of due diligence. Cause not only are you doing due diligence on the deal, the bank is doing due diligence on a deal. Yep. So it's added an extra pain in the butt, like getting email questions on what is this, this, this X, Y, and Z, blah, blah, blah. Thankfully, the bank's familiar with this deal. It's a local credit union. Um, you actually have to live here to be a member of it. So um, turns out I live here, so that works. Um, but yeah, they're familiar with the deal. They've underwritten the property. Appraisers actually appraised it in the past. So everything's super familiar with the process. So that's a huge blessing. But that's kind of some of the due diligence answers. There we go. And by the way, we will be answering some questions. We're trying to make it more about the business and sales process. Of course, this applies to real estate or business, uh, but we will be cherry picking the questions as opposed to my normal format of just answering the questions till they go. So um, just note, please ask your questions. We'll be cherry picking a few of them for the purposes of this video, but I'm already seeing some really good ones that are, that are going through. Okay. So you negotiate, you figure out your pieces, uh, you get to the, my favorite part of the deal is where you have to raise the capital and I'll, I'll speak oh, to this. So fun. Raising capital is very fun. And it's just like the sale. It's you have to sell someone on your idea. There's a few rules for this in real estate. It applies to business as well. 
First, before you talk numbers, sell them on the vision and the story. You want people to want to be a part of the adventure. So piece of real estate. Here's the building. Here's the town. This is why I'm excited about this project. Then you want to overcome the problems before they're asked. Here's everything that we're aware of that's wrong with the building. Here's our solution. And this is why we have the deal that we have. And this is how we're going to make money solving the problems. You've now cleared a majority of the objections. You've showed that you have a mastery of your business and you're on to the part where you actually go over the numbers and ask for capital. Going over numbers should just be verifying what they're already starting to believe, which is this is a fun project. This is a well-planned out project. And now I can see on paper, where's my money going? How is it secured? And how is it being multiplied? And if you get all those pieces, you get a yes every time. On this particular deal, since I haven't been as involved uh, through your entire journey on this one as I have some of your past deals, on the capital side of this deal, what is the capital raise looking like? Yeah, this one, this is the largest capital raise I've ever personally done. This one's coming in about $400,000. So I mean, that the previous highest I've had before this was 250. So it's almost one and a half times bigger. Mm -hmm. Or um, yeah, about in there. So yeah, this one, um, it's basically the same thing. It's just larger sums of money, you just go to bigger fish. <laughs> it's nothing crazy. <laughs> They're all people, people at the end of the day. If you're looking on a single family house, yep, you're probably not going to go to your million dollar guy. If you're looking at a 26 unit, you're probably not going to go to your single family guy. I don't do single family, but if you're buying smaller deals, you're going to have different investors than if you're buying bigger deals. So it's pretty much the same thing. And it just starts the opportunity like, hey, like it holds a lot of weight with investors when you're as committed to the project as you are. Like for me, I moved across the country to live in this project. Um, I'm buying a deal at 1.4 miles away. I'm living in the town. I'm involved in the town. I meet with owners all the time. Like I'm very well connected here, I like to think. So it's that holds some weight with them too. When you're when they start asking about the project and you're explaining the significance of the opportunity, it's like, hey, I bought a great deal. This is a better deal. It's even closer to campus. This is the vision. This is what we're gonna do. This is how we're gonna overcome their current problems. And this is how and then you kind of be like, hey, this is how much money you're gonna make. And after all that significance, the money's just like the cherry on top. And they're like, awesome, we're good, let's go. Yeah. And when Caleb says he bought a great deal, I would rank it top three deals of anyone in the multifamily strategy mentorship program. It is. And we're, and we're, we're putting that with top three in your guys' deals too. So your, your guys' uh, deals are included in that. It, it's up there. The, the only ones that I think it would have difficulty up against is the original 38, much easier project, not as much upside. Some of that was also market timing. Um, and then, potentially the mobile home park that we just bought since we bought it for such a huge win on price. But I would say, yeah, it's probably better than any other deal he did, which would put it in the top three. I'd probably rank it number three of the deals that if this was one of my deals, it'd probably come in right at number three. It's a fantastic deal. Much nicer building than the first 38 unit. That oh, I it's awesome. New building too. It'd be the newest building I own built. No three. Oh yeah. No, I was talking about your, your 25 unit that you won. If you close this one, probably the best deal done in the out of the whole group. It is phenomenal on numbers and you want on price. Let's talk a little business acquisition, by the way, mm -hmm. you've done, you've done the hard way. And I, okay. So Grant Cardone will disagree with this. He's putting out a lot of content on this. I think entrepreneurs should start their first company because it's brutally hard and you will learn a lot about oh, yes, a lot. It is. And then you will learn why you never want to start your own company again. Just like I think people should self-manage their buildings. You do it to learn the rules of the game and understand why you don't want to do it yourself again. So you're, you've started your own company from scratch, from, from literal zero, no revenue, no clients, no business plan, no it, nothing. Just you and your cell phone. How has that process been? Give us a little backstory yeah. on, on what, what it is that you created and how hard it's been over the last year and a half going from zero to... You're doing what? Your company does twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month. It's, yeah, essentially. Yeah, uh, right in there. I mean, it started off like I mean, being a broke kid doing DoorDash, looking for another stream of income, and it kind of started learning like, oh, I'm actually not bad at sales, and that kind of started from being very personable, being very outgoing, being like very transparent with everything. Yep. So then kind of started going down that path. And then, I mean, from there, it's been grinding every single day. Like people are like, oh, business, like, oh, cool. Like, like I, like the business is probably worth over half a million dollars today, which is awesome. And, but it's like, I want to go 3 million by the end of the year. And it's like, 
oh, that was, that's so cool. That's cute. It's like, no, it is a ton of work. It's a ton of sleepless nights. It's, it's your whole day. It becomes your life up front. And that's what Christian's talking about when he's like, you never want to do it again. I, I don't want to start a business again. I do not want to rebuild this. I don't want to do it again. Like earlier, we were talking about like marketing, like sales and marketing kind of go together. They're cohesive. And so mm-hmm. if I was to buy, if I was to do marketing, a marketing wing, it would be buying a marketing company. It would not be starting a marketing company. And one thing a lot of people don't understand, I don't know if it's just my generation and your generation, um, but businesses are typically acquired more often on seller financing than real estate is, which makes it a heck of a lot easier. Yeah, no, by, by a ton. What is, I, and I've started a few. So I started multifamily strategy, which has been just absolutely incredible watching that, you know, evolve into the seven figure and soon to be multi number, number one alumni. I'm taking that from Ethan. I am the number one alumni. I, 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 I feel like we'll see. And those, uh, <laughs> those who are watching and who are new to the multifamily strategy program, you got your, uh, you got your work set up for you. Caleb's done very, very well. He is not the only one who's done very well, but I would make the argument. You close this deal. You are the undisputed champion. Until uh, until someone else rises up to take the crown, yeah, there's gonna be some random person who buys like a thousand units, and I'll be like, "Well, damn, I guess." There we go. I, I have a it. feeling that you will get there faster than most. That is my instinct. If that's something I wouldn't that be you surprised, I think you'll get there. I would not be surprised. I mean, we'll see what happens. Ideally, here, like I switch from like the whole statewide thing to going hyper local. It's like Stephenville surrounding areas are kind of where i'm looking at oh that's actually a good question how many multifamily alumni are there how many are is it now it's at least a few hundred huh yeah let me see if i can toss that that question up there when did that when did that one come in exactly oh, there we go. that's a new one PM. then we'll go then we'll go all the way back up and we'll start answering some of these questions here how many multifamily strategy alumni are there of the course we have passed a thousand people who have gone all the way through the course and i'm counting all the wow. way through the course the metric is they've completed at least 80%. Because I assume there's some sections of the course, like I just launched a uh, a Section 8 add-on, which at no charge, we always add to this thing. Uh, but I, I actually whole... do Section 8 too. I there we go. That on this building. Cody and I have made seven figures with a Section 8 strategy in our portfolio. I figured if we made a million dollars doing it, we should include the knowledge. Um, there's some people who take multifamily strategy who are buying hospitality and class A real estate. They will not watch that section. So I consider 80% or more of the course were completed a graduate of the course. We've just crossed a thousand of those. I mean, through the mentorship program, the last I checked, we were just about at 300. I know we've had a a strong start to the year with, with we've actually had a really good wave of people early February. So I would say we're probably slightly north of 300 people who have either been through or are actively involved in the multifamily wow. strategy mentorship, which is incredible. Absolutely. Speaking incredible. of sex, section eight, uh, I just did the math on this building alone. Uh, since I bought it, I've added anywhere from 500 to $700,000 equity strictly through working on section eight. Well, that sounds like we're going to need to do a whole bonus live on section eight. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but not I, today. Like, today is business and sales. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get to the question. Let's get through a few questions and then I want to talk about acquisition. You said something about bringing on a marketing company. I have I have thoughts about your sales company and what that would look like, but let's uh let's answer a couple of these here. Let me try to cherry pick a couple. Are we going top to bottom, bottom to top? What are we doing? Uh, I'm going to go as as I as I see them here. Well, this will be a little bit more free. This is a good. This is a good question. Um, I'll take this one. Uh, thinking Thank AI. Please do. Um, are you working with complex performers or back of the napkin stuff or a software? I mean, so first, your first absolute first step is back of the napkin stuff. Like, if it doesn't pencil back of the napkin, you can investigate a little bit more with proforma, but that's the first step. Like, for instance, this deal I'm buying right now. Um, Market rent is somewhere between because if you want to go conservative, you're 850 to 900 on one beds. These mm-hmm. one beds are going for 550 dollars a unit. 21 out of 26 are on month to month, and the section eight here guarantees 857 dollars. And the section eight's two counties away, which is the worst market, and they still guarantee 857. So bare minimum, I have 307 dollars website a unit. So that's like, wow. that's where the pro forma comes in. And the bank mm-hmm. is actually working. I don't know how common this is. This is my first time I worked at the bank. They're actually working with me on pro form, forma numbers a little bit here because they lend on stuff here all the time. They've, I'm pretty sure they've lent on this one in the past from the two owners back. And they're like, wow. oh, those rents are so low. Like, like I talked to the guy, like he's, his office literally less than my way from my house. 
or my apartment. And he's like, oh, yeah, no, that should be at, be at least 850. Completely understand. Yeah, well, yeah. And I'm getting 80% LTV on it. So, I mean, there's kind of like, it depends how you're looking at it, but it's a little bit of both. And then software, I just use the original calculator I got from Christian's mentorship when I was 18. I just still use the same exact one. Yep. Uh, on the basics of a deal, like I'm interested based on just the entry, like the, the entry level stuff. I don't, a, a basic, here's what the rents look like and here's the expenses because I'm hyper local and I know that my areas are Grant County, Washington, and now you know, a little bit in the border towns in Texas. And we're, we'll be doing a lot more expansion. Uh, I'll be doing some personally in Texas here the next year. But flower mound <laughs> flower mound yep moving moving in texas myself to go open up my markets i like being near my properties so that'll be the next adventure stay tuned for that but for grant county washington which is the bulk of my portfolio i know what units are going to go for and i know what it costs to renovate them so i don't care as much about how the building's performing because i own the property management company and because i own most of the neighboring properties I can walk into any building right now. I'm looking at actually trading one of my larger buildings for a eight unit building. We'll see if it comes together, but that trade would give me one levered 20 something unit building and trade it for a free and clear eight plex. I'll own it with absolutely no debt. And I have the firepower to replace the roof, the siding, renovate every single unit, replace every single water heater, and have a basically, oh, and then I'm going to take the whole building from uh, copper piping to PEX. I'll have oh, basically a brand new building with not $1 of debt on it, trading one of my larger levered buildings. I will take that trade every day of the week because it eliminates an obligation and completes a project. Half completed projects suck. Getting to start with a project that's bite-sized, that I can knock out all the way very quickly. Freaking Money. love it. I don't care what it's bringing in though. The Performa, I know down that same street, I'm renting a unit at 925 and a smaller unit at 1,100. I can get that whole thing leased at 1,000. I'll be bringing in a gross $8,000 a month on no debt whatsoever. That is real quick work. too. Nick Yates question next. Okay. I'm going to share one more thing on this though. The building that I am looking at trading, I bought 100% leveraged. So I have no money in that deal. It would cost some money to finish it. With this trade, I will have no money in the next deal. So I will have no debt and I will have paid off all my debt through one swap on one deal and I'll own Heck something yeah. free and clear. That is a cool deal. Is it a smaller building? Yes. But without a dollar leaving my pocket, I can have a completely paid off building with no mortgage that is brand new and completed. That is an exciting project. We're working on that now. I don't need a complex pro forma for that though. I just know, hey, I know what these are going to value out at. I know that I can get the building. I know I can move my pieces. Um, if I was entering a new market, I would rely very heavily on market data, talking to brokers. There'd be a whole lot more that I'd be doing. Okay, you have a question from Nick. Um, is this the is this the pickleball question from Nick? Yes. Let's toss that up. How's your pickleball game recently? It's phenomenal. I played for three hours today. Last time Caleb and I played together, which was in uh, Bellevue, Washington, we destroyed. We kind of got we kind of no. got like beat up the first two games, and then we went we like, were 0 eleven games two. undefeated. Yeah, zero and two, then do eleven and two. If anybody wants to play pickleball, I will be. When is your event in the Northwest? May, I believe the second. I'm going to be launching We're a ton of marketing for it. We're going to be uh, Vancouver, Washington. Two hundred fifty people. And tickets are, they went on sale like two days ago. Um, check that out, nwactionsummit.com, I believe is correct. Well, we'll be playing a bunch of pickleball. If you want to play Christian Iron Pickleball, come play. If you're four, if you're five zero, you've got a shot. <laughs> if you're under a four, there's no way. If you don't understand that, you don't play pickleball. Yeah, we're, uh, can, can, we, you'll want to get the earlier games. Caleb and I take a second to warm up, but once we're cooking, we're cooking. Not said. That's funny. That I like that a lot. I love that. I love Nick. I don't know you. I just what a question. Uh, Ty wanted a, a quick update, by the way. So, did you get another deal in Texas? Not quite yet. You're about twenty yeah. days out. Yeah, twenty days from closing under contract. Oh, here's and looking at one. another twenty. 
What's the temperature of the market? Temperature like? of the market, like overall up. So your area. And your uh, area Stephen so Mill we, is we on both invest in different areas. How about your area? Uh, Stephen Mill is on fire. Tarleton is the fast growing university in the state of Texas, some of the most stable agriculture in the nation. And I yep. have already plugged into every single owner. Um, so I am super excited about how this is going. Like I said, I have a 26 unit right now, 24 unit lined up afterwards. Um, yeah, I'm pretty much going pedal to metal. Love it. And for my area, Moses Lake is having the uh, the one of the largest battery manufacturers in the U.S. is moving in for for like electric car batteries. Uh, we're bringing in 600 jobs from one. We're bringing in a few more jobs from another battery factory. I just drove and watched the facilities they're building. They're absolutely massive. So we are getting a ton more jobs. Uh, we're also redoing the entire medical district and building a whole like giant medical campus that is going to be another several hundred jobs in the next few years. So Grant County is doing very well, especially in the Moses Lake area up in a town called Ephrata, which is 20 minutes north of Moses Lake. It's another town I own several units in. I've been there. Microsoft is doing a $1 billion expansion to their data center. They're building a $1 billion data center up there that should it'll deliver somewhere in the next several years. Um, but lots of jobs, lots of industrial, cheapest power in the U.S., so you have a lot of the manufacturing and then just like Stephenville, a heavy backbone in very stable agriculture. Yeah, I really like the stable agriculture there, honestly, too. And like in Tarleton, like building a brand new basketball arena, brand new medical building, another thousand unit student home, student housing center, another massive building going on campus all right now. And a three story parking garage that's like right on the main road. So I'm right there with you. Like you drive around here. It's like, oh, that's going up. That's going up. That's going up. That's going up. I, I always try to answer these questions when they come in. So there's no ambiguity course and mentorship with multifamily strategy. Part of the, the same thing. Yes. If you get the mentorship, you get the course and course is the information. Mentorship is what I want to work on people with. Like that's the application. So of course you get the course with that, but mentorship, we meet three times a week. Uh, I actually have a few people in here like Dylan who joined recently. Um, really, Let's go. really, yeah, really, really fun. That is the thing that I'm spending the most energy on this year. I want to keep tooling that out. I want to keep adding more sections to it. I want to just get more and more and more content in there. In addition, you get to watch. I don't think anyone should do this because it would take you forever. Every recording we've ever had of the mentorship is live in the software. I think there's over a hundred. I think right now, oh, well, I guess not ever, but over the last year anyway, there's like 120 hours of mentorship calls where you can just go back and just watch any of the past calls as well. In addition, there's 200 mini videos in the course. So when I'm talking about content, I don't think there is any mentorship group that has the same amount of build out that we already have. And we're going to make this thing astronomically bigger this year. So check that out. Multifamilystrategy.com would love to see anyone and everyone there. However, we're talking about business and sales. So that is a company that I run that I uh, I would love to continue to grow. Caleb, yeah. I want to talk to you now about, uh, you, you'd mentioned your sales company. You'd real quick, real company. quick. Okay. Julian, Julian Peterson's here. That's who introduced me to you guys. No way. Julianne, first of all, huge fan. She runs a, a, a podcast or weekly meeting called Zoom at 8, which I've had the privilege of being a guest at. Uh, Julianne, good to see you. You started this whole relationship. You've got me my pickleball buddy and one of my best friends in the world. So thank you, Julianne. And would it be fair to say that your company would not have come together if not from our relationship? That yeah, I would say that is what gave the idea to springboard it. I don't know if she still runs it, but she ran the best meetup in San Diego that I've been to. So that's where I got connected, but that that it, I would check it out 100%. Oh, Zoom at 7. We we switched. We switched. We went earlier. She said it's I don't know that I can handle the rebrand. Uh Yeah, but... <laughs> we can kick her out. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh yeah, but a, a special thank you to to Julianne, a, a huge contributor to where we're at today, both of us. Um a lot of great connections from her. Always fantastic to see her here. She's on LinkedIn too. That's mind blowing. There we go. Caleb is the best. That is an undisputed. She fact. said it, not me. She said it, not me. That's okay. If she didn't, you would have. Um, okay, <laughs> moving on. Moving on. Okay, Caleb, you talked about adding a marketing arm. 
Mm -hmm. As your company expands, what would that look like? Because I am of the belief that acquisition is greater than starting your own business. There's something Andy Florence told me when I was at CoStar, which I'm sure he stole from someone else. But there is no reason to build your own market when someone else can build a market and you can take it from them. So I, mean, I, I think it depends where you're at, right? Like at 18 years old with no money, um, what was I going to do, right? I mean, I wasn't going to go out and be like, oh, I'm going to go acquire a company. Like I, I had no idea what I was doing. After being in business for about, what, about uh, about a year now, um, year and a half in real estate, two years in real estate, year and a half into straight business. Um, I do mm -hmm. not want to get to that slow grind again. The first year, first couple of years for some people, I mean, it's still going to be a couple of years for me, is a grind. It's like you're working every day. You learn all the rules of your company. You're learning every single part of the process. And it's like, why not just buy a company that's aged, that has experience, that has a track record? There's no point in just trying to start one straight off the ground from scratch. So I do not. And I don't know marketing. I had to learn how to do sales. Um, that was its own beast. I don't want to learn how to do marketing all over again from the ground up and how to build out systems for that. Rather just buy it from somebody who has them. Well, for anyone who watches my weekly uh, interviews, and I'm doing a lot more of these, there'll be one new one every single week. I just did one with Henry Washington, but I asked the same question in every single one, which is, what is the thing that you are the best in the world at? And I think Caleb's company, he's found the thing that he's the best in the world at. I've never seen anyone as good as he is at social media, automation, creation of funnels, the, the way that things move through social media and the way his company plugs in there has been absolutely phenomenal. So in your situation, what I would do, unsolicited advice, is find someone whose thing they're best in the world at is that marketing that ties in right to the company. So it's something that has that, that niche of like, hey, I am good at using social media posts and marketing to generate a front end funnel. And then your, your company comes in and you're already a master of the middle and end of that pipeline. If you found someone who did that and you acquire that company with your now becoming very significant uh, income through your business, you've built enough business where you can now start taking out smaller businesses, assimilating them and creating a larger machine, which is how I mean, I think it should be done. I think that, I mean, that's the whole goal. If you're watching anybody who has been like anything in business, like down the line, oh, as these companies expand to millions to tens of millions to hundreds to even bigger. It's just all M and A, like that's all all it becomes down to mergers and acquisitions, and it's like these people like like the biggest companies in the world don't want to start a brand new little mom and pop thing. They're like, oh, we rather just buy a one that's already established and grow them to where we want it to be. And that's the same kind of. I'm obviously not that big, but that's kind of same same exact thought process. I'd rather just grow the companies to where I want them to be and kind of be able to retool, pick and choose instead of having to build it from the ground up. Mm -hmm. By the way, got to throw this in here. Uh, Noah's thrown down the gauntlet, Caleb. <laughs> we'll see what happens <laughs> whenever we're back whenever i'm back home we'll figure it out i am in, and I, i'm not i need to get my schedule set but on the 20th of next month i am in san diego for a couple of podcasts i am not sure if i'm spending extra day down there if i am i'll be down in san diego caleb are you down in san diego play, if, if you're going i might have to go if you can commit to two days so we can get a day at the hub i will come all right there we go Here's a question. This is a good sales question. This is business related because it works for business and uh, and real estate. Where did you meet your capital partners? Do you Caleb? want to go first for me? You, you go ahead and go first if, if, if you're ready to launch. Otherwise, I can dive right in. Yeah. Uh, relationships before I was ever even thinking about real estate. Uh, people that just like knew around town that were in real estate, whether it's general contractors, roofers, whatever those two guys were first two of my two of my first ever capital partners um off facebook um off of multifamily strategy off of mutual connections and then one has been like just free endorsed but um at bigger pockets con 2022 um met one of my best friends and capital partners so those have been the majority of where i've met mine i mean it kind of comes through everything it just comes down to talking about what you're doing with everybody like like if anybody's like, oh, what do you do? It's like, you just kind of talk about what you're interested in. Even if you're not doing it yet, it's like, oh yeah, I'm in real estate. Try like looking to do X, Y, and Z. You share your goals. You put them out there. If you're putting them out there consistently, people are going to want to go on that adventure with you. Exactly 
Right. And for me, it was mostly like most of the people who I have partnered with or as far as capital partners uh, have been other owners who own real estate. Usually it's people who want to scale up. I buy a little bit bigger than a lot of mom and pop owners. So when I first started, it was people who owned duplexes through 10 units and I was picking up, you know, 38 to 25 unit buildings. People were excited to be a part of that. They were already comfortable with being an investor. But a lot of the people who have been capital partners for me are people who are farther through the game, who I have sat down with, had coffee with and asked, how did you get where you're at? The more mature investors also typically have more money. And some of them don't do the deal finding as much as guys like Caleb and I do. So when we have these opportunities, they're like, oh man, my business has evolved to wherever it's at. They're doing whatever they're best in the world at. And you have these opportunities where they're like, boy, this is really exciting. I like what you're putting together. These are opportunities I want to be a part of. Let's go ahead and put it together. But for me, a lot of them have been the same owners that I tell everyone to meet with. Those are who you need to be meeting for capital as well. Yep. Oh, I just record. Okay, so next week, and I think it's going to be Friday or Saturday, I'll be dropping a podcast with Michael Zuber. That, well, it's not technically a podcast. It's just on YouTube. But on Multifamily Strategy on YouTube, uh, we will have a recording with Michael Zuber where we actually both share our opinions on syndication. Not a fan. Any strategy can work in real estate, including syndication. For those who don't know what that is, essentially what you're doing is you're crowdsourcing a whole bunch of money. You're usually going to, usually but not always, going to use a bank for some of the money and your crowdsourced funds for the rest. You're filing mm -hmm. a security. There's two things that I don't like about syndication. One, it has been marketed to the masses as a way to get into real estate with none of your own money, which means not a lot a of good idea. people who are not operators of real estate are buying deals that are bigger than they should. I talk about the stupid tax all the time. You will pay money to learn the things you don't know you don't know when you go into a deal. And you only fix that with experience. The problem is in syndication, people have a habit of getting into deals that are 10 to 100 times larger than they are ready for. And the stupid tax on that is 10 to 100 times more than they can afford. Problem number one. Problem number two with syndication, a large part of the payment of a syndication is done on the front end. They're paid fees to find the deal, to close the deal, to manage the deal. Upfront fees for a project where they haven't made their clients money yet, there's a misalignment between the operator and the ultimate goal. Now, I've met many great syndicators who are fantastic operators. Terrence Doyle is a friend of ours that comes to mind immediately. He also does Terrence's a money. ton of seller financing. Since he did our podcast with Cody and I, he swapped his model, does a whole bunch more creative finance. So there's no bank or a really small bank loan. And then it's just him and his syndication. He's allowed to get super creative with it. Terrence is a developer and an operator. He knows how to do construction. He knows how to do property management. It's all in-house. A guy like that can syndicate. Mom and pop owners getting into the game. Syndication is a tool for experienced players. You either partner with a very experienced operator or you say, hey, this is something I'll do when I'm bigger and able to take out the 100-unit project. That's my thoughts on syndication. Yeah. Caleb, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, piggybacking off that, right? I mean, you were kind of assuming when we talk about syndication, we're talking about bigger deals that we can't put together on our own. Like we're not talking really about syndicating 10 units, 20 units, even. I mean, sometimes you get up to 50s, but we're kind of talking about the bigger complexes. And a lot of the issue, like Christian said, is you're getting people like, if it was an 18 year old Caleb Pommel, who's like, I'm gonna go syndicate a 75 unit. If something goes wrong with that 75 unit, 18 year old Caleb Pommel's bankrupt. Like granted, like it's, I only started $300, but it's like, and I probably get paid up front. And then if the investors lose their butts. It's like, hey, what the heck? And that's where the misalignment comes in. There's been a lot of stuff going on. I mean, there's been people out there defaulting on thousands of units. And we're kind of just seeing it kind of is getting a little rough, to say the least. Caleb, what made you choose Stephenville? What are some of the key things that you look for going into a new market? I mean, at the end of the day, it's like the first thing is population growth. If you're going to worldpopulationreview.com, if it's not growing, then I wouldn't even look there. I mean personally unless you have a super competitive advantage like you know every property manager and owner in town already like cool maybe look at it but for me it's like if i'm going into a brand new market it's got to be growing and then you're looking to see what's driving that growth 
for a steam mill, it's a university that's going off. It's super stable jobs in agriculture. It's all this industry expansion. It's like, that's what's driving it. That's what I look for in a market where it's like, if you're looking in like middle of nowhereville and gosh, I don't want to offend anybody on here. Where do we think nobody's from? Like Kansas, middle of nowhereville, Kansas, like 6,000 people. And you're losing like 3% a year. I'm probably not buying there. Yeah. And it just depends. There, there's some great markets right now in Kansas. So it, it all oh, just no, depends on, on where no, Wichita's you're awesome. Yeah. It, it, you're looking for population growth. You're looking for job stability. And those are two main things. At the end of the day, supply and demand. You're supplying housing. It's needed. Where can you do it? And I would add to that, as you start to get a little bit bigger, where do you make the biggest difference? There's actually a significant homeless problem in Moses Lake. And some of it, a large part of it, has to do with an inability of housing authority to place people. So that was an individual need in our market that needed to be met. So our company became very good at entry-level housing, studio to one beds, so that we can place these people affordably within housing minimums. We built a business around the need that was in that market. So if you take it one step farther, the market where you can serve an individual need that is not being met is where you're going to make the most money in real estate because there is unlimited demand for the most part for large problems. The larger the problem you solve, almost every time, the more money there is in it for you. I love this next question from zero to hero. Thoughts of going from wholesaling to invest in multifamily. I feel like Washington market is too saturated. One, Negative ghost rider. One, uh, disagree. If you're trying to invest in Texas, everyone wants to invest in Texas. Have you ever heard of a Texan who wants to invest in Washington state? No. We have horrible, horrible landlord laws. It's very difficult to do business here. It's very expensive to do business here. Uh, it is Washington State is fairly easy to compete in. Now, the, making the transition to wholesalers. I love this. Wholesalers, right now, if you are wholesaling, take your last wholesaling commission and just join multifamily strategy right now. You have every single skill you need to buy a piece of real estate. I know a ton of wholesalers in Washington. They have everything in front of them to do the deal, but they opt to wholesale it for a fee instead of own the real estate. And there's one or two things that need to be tweaked, but you already have every single skill. You know how to find the deal. You know how to present the deal. You can change it from finding the person I'll flip it to, to the capital partner to close it with. You need maybe a little operational guidance on how to structure the deal. In addition, if you know how to sell or finance these or at least ask for it correctly, some of these deals that you're like, oh, it's under contract, it's going to be a great deal for someone, that someone absolutely can be you. Well over half of the wholesale deals that I have looked at, the wholesaler could have closed it had they tweaked one or two things. So that is None of these lives are an ad for any of our stuff, but I'm serious. If you are a successful wholesaler or you've successfully completed at least one wholesale transaction and you would rather own real estate, take that last commission and just sign up and I'll see you in there. Wholesalers literally have done everything they need to do to have success in this. I think it is the most obvious candidate for working with Cody and I. Caleb contributes all the time, by the way, on multifamily strategy, even on the course. Uh, Caleb's been a guest speaker, what, 10 times now? Just, Gosh, yeah, at least double digits. Fantastic. Uh, join, be part of that. Uh, we need more of you in the community. The, the deal finders are epic. We have people in that group who can partner with you, who can fund the deal. I actually have a few people who just joined just so they can get a better feel for underwriting. And when some of the newer people come in, they're like, I'm just here to see whose deals I want to fund. I have a couple of people who are just sitting there waiting to fund your deals. So I'll see you all in there. That's a mean, no need to get offensive. Are you? Well, no, but I do want to, I do want to touch on this. I, I do want to touch on this on a serious note. There are wholesalers. And I've looked at a lot of deals where people wholesale trash more often people wholesaling. There, there's two things wholesaling. You either get addicted to the cash, which is easy to do because you're often living off the cash and you can, most don't, but you can make a ton of money wholesaling. Um, there's a couple legitimate reasons to wholesale. One, 
the deal is not the right deal for you, but you love the deal, which is why you went under contract. Maybe something's changed throughout. Two, you have a need for liquidity elsewhere in your portfolio that is greater than your need for more units. There's an argument to be made for Cody and I. I have more units and more equity. We talk a lot about our three resource pools, liquidity, cash flow, and equity. I have millions and millions of dollars of equity. I am six figures of cash right now, which is not enough for, for our projects, not even kind of enough. And I'm actually doing pretty well in cash flow. Liquidity would happen on a wholesale. I could do a deal and say, hey, liquidity to me right now is worth more than more equity. And it could make sense. So there is a place for wholesaling. It's kind of like syndication. Do I love it? No, I think people use it as a crutch and it gets way overused. Do I like wholesaling as a business? Absolutely not. Wholesaling is a tool in your tool belt as an investor where you could pass it profitably to the next person to adjust your resources. I think it makes sense. And that's where wholesalers will sell good deals when they're already a good operator and they could take out the deal themselves. That is my argument for that. Uh, and I, I, I think you're backing... Piggybacking on that, I mean, wholesaling multifamily is bigger checks than single family. Um, this guy says you can wholesale multifamily to yourself, though, right? Uh, that's just what we call an assignment fee. Um, but yes, you can. And if I was to get liquid, if I started with zero dollars again, I would, even if it was small, on the 38, Cody and I had no money. I would have charged a 30, maybe a $30,000 assignment fee from us putting together the entire deal and going through a ton of legwork. We close the deal. Cody gets $15,000. I get $15,000. Um, it cost me about $7,000 at that time to live the life that I lived. I'm like, cool. I just paid for my next two months of time by doing this deal. Now we're rolling. A little thing like that can make a huge difference. And that's just wholesaling to yourself, which is an assignment fee, which is all wholesaling is. Um, you just assign the contract from your name and or assigns into the LLC with the partners the small fee, kind of like how syndication gets an acquisition fee, but typically it's a much smaller fee. And it's just saying, hey, look, I found the deal and I found most of the debt because seller financed and I'm going to run the deal. I'm going to take a little teeny piece up front and then we're going to knock this thing out as partners on a joint venture. I mean, I've looked like we're picking back on wholesaling. I've looked into it on deals where it's like, hey, I'm going to get a multiple six figure wholesale fee up front if that's the case i mean if there's certain things in your universe where it's like hey i have like let's say you have 200 units and you're strapped for cash and your cash flowing out of your butt it's like maybe you take a look at that but for the most part i'm just saying close the deal you're not going to get the generational wealth just from wholesaling everything by the way zero uh th this is interesting so zero is gonna gonna join after his next wholesale deal caleb you saw it here it's verified. Whoa, we switched spots. I don't know how I did that. That was an accident. What did I'm you going back. do? Whoa. Uh, <laughs> I closed my next wholesaling deal. Um, uh, I wholesale in Spokane. I used to manage in Spokane, by the way. I shut that down because it's not my core business. Uh, but if anyone wants the JV, I have a buyer's list here for Idaho. Um, Idaho is a much easier state to landlord in by a lot. Yes. Like by a lot, lot than Washington State. Um, that... If I was younger in my career, I actually looked very closely back before the boom. This is like 2010. I was looking at like how could, and this, granted, this is right when I got out of high school. So I was Cody's age. I was looking at how do I invest in Spokane, Spokane Valley, and uh, parts of Idaho. I was actually looking at Coeur d'Alene really closely. And I had a lender call me and say, hey, uh, the market's about to, it, it's going to keep crashing. It's, it's, it's recovering a little bit. It's, this is a horrible time to buy. I could have bought my first multifamily deal. It would have just been a duplex, but I could have bought a duplex at 18 years old in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and it would be worth well over twice what I would have bought it for. And I didn't because someone told me not to. So a uh, small have, side have. note, but uh, if people are looking for deals, Zero the Hero has the deals, connect with him. Zero, if there's a way to connect with you on, uh, on Instagram or somewhere that's easier to message than Facebook, you have my permission to go ahead and drop your handle in the chat. I get connected someone look at his deals and if he has a good deal let's let's figure out how to close this one Let, let's close this one as a multifamily team as opposed to uh wholesale on it that'd make me happy would you guys buy a deal where you can do a mortgage assumption yes and yes. later someone mentioned you do have to qualify for the debt or you find someone who you partner with who would qualify 
I don't qualify for my bank loan. Let's just put it that way. I am imagining, I'm imagining the capital partner. I've, I know. So by the way, for those who don't know, Caleb's a better opener than I am. I, is it fair to say I'm a, I'm a currently because of my 11 years more of life, I might be a better negotiator or closer. Is that fair? I'd say you also worked a sales job, but I'm catching you. I have, I have a lot of years of, of high, high, high ticket sales. My highest, highest contract was an eight year contract at $16 million a year. So I've sold some stuff. Caleb's a better opener than my, than I am. And because of that, some of the capital people that Caleb has touched are, he has individual people who could just buy my $100 million people. Caleb has a deep arsenal of capital partners. Is it fair to say that the capital partner that you have on your 26 uh, does not have a problem qualifying for $1.6 million? I don't think he's ever thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Caleb has a deep roster. And, and I want to point out, Caleb's 21 years old. And you started, you bought your first deal. Was it a little less than two years ago? Or is it more than two years now? It's a little less than two still. A little less than two years ago. Anyone can play this game. Anyone can make it in real estate in their first five years. Caleb, 99% chance Caleb will cross the millionaire threshold this year. Probably in just his company outside of real estate. Yeah, but we're also in real estate. the company. I think yeah, you'll do both. The company alone. I think you'll do both. Right now... I mean, I mean, dude, let's just talk real numbers. Like, what's your net worth right now today? Best guess. Best guess. I mean, gosh, if you're getting this valued at T Town Creek, what it's valued at, some other stuff, what it's valued at, I might be there already. I'm, I'm getting close. Okay. Like, I'm pretty. So I'm swimming up next to it pretty close, at least. Okay, we're gonna say eight fifty. I, I want it to be when you say I've made it to a million. I want it to be indisputable. Like, no one could disagree. That you're worth a million bucks. Okay. And I just need to do another, another good deal and I'll be there easy. Yeah. So close out this next deal. Caleb is within his first two years of real estate investing is going to be a millionaire. That is fantastic and way younger than I was. With a lot of business and sales experience, it took me 11 months to go from a $400,000 net worth to millionaire. Anyone can play this game. I want to say this, and this is actually one of the main things I wanted to talk about here before we got sidetracked with great questions. Caleb is one of the only people in my universe who can work as, I'm, honestly, I mean, he can work as hard as I can. I don't say that about anyone. I have never been outworked in a job. I've never been outworked in a company. I've never been outworked in a position. I will put in more hours and I'll put in more efficient hours and I'll put in more time than anyone else. Caleb's the one other person I've seen who can do the same level of output. It's pretty incredible. If you're not that person, that is okay. You are who you are. You don't need to force yourself to be something that you're not. Caleb did it. Millionaire, two years. Me, I took eight years figuring out what I wanted to do. And then once I figured out what I wanted to do, within a year, millionaire. Anyone can do this in real estate. Anyone can do it in business. A million dollars sounds like a lot to some and sounds like nothing, especially to Caleb's capital partners. It's nothing. You can do this in one to two years. Everyone who is watching this can do this in a five-year period, period. Anyone can do this. Oh, no question whatsoever. It's did you buy five deals where you have 200,000 in equity in five years. What? Like, that's what you should be looking for in every single deal. Like, there, you should be a millionaire within five years, bare minimum. I'm trying to keep this one more about business and sales. I will answer a real estate, very, very specifically real estate question though, because it's it's interesting. Underwriting 30 units, the net operating income's a little thin, uh, but it's due for rent raises. So, okay, so we're, we're it's value add based on the rental increases. That's exactly what Caleb is buying right now, by the way. Super light on NOI because rents are just, just above half of market. Uh, what is your minimum debt to income ratio? Debt to income is going to play more of a factor when you're in the residential space. So if you're talking yep. a zero to four, well, not a zero unit is not a building, is it? Um, a one to four Correct. unit opportunity. Uh, a zero unit, everyone can, uh, that, that's a piece of land. I already own a zero unit. <laughs> there we go. Um, debt to income is more important there. What you're really looking at is DSCR. So that is your debt service coverage ratio. That's the main of, of a few. That's the main qualifier for that type of debt. I want to have, and this is what banks want to see. Usually they want to see at least a 1.1 to 1.25, if not higher. 
I like to see a clear path within the first six months to get to 1.5 or higher. I usually acquire at 1.5 or higher. Right now, portfolio wide, if you if you exclude the two hotels that I'm mid process of converting, because obviously those have higher vacancy, those are a project. If you count the rest of our portfolio outside of our recent projects we just acquired, I maintain a debt service coverage ratio of at least two, which is super hard for me to go bankrupt. Super hard. That means I save two times what I pay in mortgage on every property on average. If you are at one and a half times your mortgage payments and extra savings after all expenses, banks are going to love you. 1.5 is the magic number. Banks are going to start qualifying again somewhere around 1.2, 1.25. Uh, that's the number they're looking at. Caleb's deal does not pencil there. I think it's closer to 1.1. His banker is looking at the massive upside in rents and the fact that Caleb is an operator in that market already getting higher than the target rents. And they're willing to just wave it and say, you know what? You have the experience. You've proven that you can do this. You own a 25 unit building that has one beds. You're buying a 26 unit building a mile and a half away. We trust that you can get there. To get your DSCR where it needs to be, we're going to give you two years of interest only. The bank is going to write a product to his needs to get him to qualify. So that's the DSCR. Yep, doesn't suck. Mason has a, a good question here. This is a business one. Advice on working long, efficient hours in your business. So I do something called the 90-day burn. I just finished it last week, by the way. 90-day burn. 90 days intense focus. and It's designed for 12 to 16 hours. I was doing like 17 to 18 hours a day, which is insane. I, that's, that's beyond what is healthy. Um, and you start to lose some efficiencies doing that. So when you are doing this, I take times where I am hyper-focused on my business. Everything else is put on the sideline. Just like, hey, I, I have specific goals and I write them down. At the end of 90 days, I will be here. And then everything I do is focused on those. And the intensity of that focus has moved me forward. I believe it's one year at a time in a 90-day period. Now, you will just blow up and be miserable if you go more than 90 days working, I mean, just working every waking hour. I optimize my workouts down to half an hour, but they're super intense. I write most of my media plan while I'm in the sauna, which is helping me recover. You don't need that, but it helps. I cut my caffeine intake take down a little bit actually through this. No alcohol. I keep everything super focused around. I am healthy. I am functional. I am focused on sleep, health, work keeping everything right there in front of me. That has worked really well for me. I have found that when I get out of a 90 day burn, I am just more efficient because I practiced being efficient. And while the requirements and the target is off me, every time I have done that, I am just a stronger operator because I've put myself through more hardship. And now I'm just used to, oh, what was really hard 90 days ago is no longer as hard. That has worked amazingly for me. I know I can work twice the hours of any of my employees. I have no problem if it's what business needs. I will go weeks at 20 hours of work with four hours of sleep. I don't care. I will skip meals for a day if that's what it takes to get through my projects, and I've done that. However, outworking people doesn't matter if it's inefficient. The efficiency comes from the focus. That's where the things like getting good sleep. I, honestly, not drinking alcohol. I'm a huge advocate for it. You sleep better and you think more clearly. Um, working out consistently. For me, setting aside the dedicated time every day to go like, hey, I read my Bible and pray every single day at a set time. When you put those disciplines in, your efficiencies go up across your entire business and in your real estate portfolio. I work out. I sleep well. I don't drink. I read my Bible. Um if you're looking for great disciplines and you're not there right now, uh, like step one, find God immediately. After that, work on all the other pieces. And those other practices have made a huge difference for me. Difference for me, Caleb, you are also a workout, a workhorse. You are also a freak of nature. The, the ability to outwork people is incredible. Would you share your baseball story and how training for baseball has made you a Titan and working in business. Cause I, I love this story and I don't know that we've shared it on this channel. 
Yeah, I mean, for sure. So, start off in baseball, I always kind of was crappy. Like, wasn't very good. It was always, like, the last pick on the Little League teams, all that stuff. Played trial ball, was never the starter, all that stuff, yada, yada, yada. Freshman year of high school was a backup on freshman split time. JV year, same thing. My junior year was canceled because of COVID. I had one at bat in eight games. Always was whatever. Uh, senior year, I made first team all San Diego, all that stuff. So one of the was a decent hitter in California. And it's like I went from nothing to that in whatever it took a while. And that's kind of what gave me the confidence to go to business. I was like, baseball is just a game. At the same time, business is just a game. It's just – I agree with Christian on the 90-day burn thing, but I'm also a big believer personally in it's like just finding consistently consistency in your everyday life. It's like for me, it's like – I read my Bible first thing I do when I get up. I don't answer texts. I don't answer anything for at least 30 minutes to an hour when I get up. It's spending time with the Word, spending time with God. That's first and foremost. If you're not doing that every day, you're doing something wrong. I just hate to tell you. Um, and then after that, it's kind of going into the business. A big thing for me that I'm working more on is dividing my day up. And mm-hmm. at the same time, I'm Christian, I'm guessing you have the same little voice in the back of your head that's always like, oh, like if you want to go do something else, it's like, oh, I could be working on my business at the same time. I could be working on this, this or that. And it's kind of just staying consistent every single day. A big thing for me is the sleep. But I found in myself when I get less than eight hours of sleep, yeah. um, just my brain starts going down the negative paths a little bit farther and a little bit easier. Where it's like if I'm on eight hours of sleep, I'm dialed in. I'm not thinking about the what ifs and the negative stuff. I'm not thinking about, hey, this could go wrong. I'm not looking at all the negatives. I'm looking at the positives. I mean, me and Christian, we're just, Christian and I were just talking about a story uh, or a video. I mean, uh, Tony Robbins with Theo Vaughn asked Theo Vaughn yeah. to look around the room everything brown and then he said okay tell me what's red Theo didn't have an answer like I'm not putting the other guys on blast whatever but that's just what comes up in your life if you're only looking for negative things all you're going to see is negative you're only looking for positive things and how to Mm -hmm. grow at the same time that's how you grow it and that's a big part of my why like what makes me able to just keep going in business it's like if I'm having fun and this is awesome like I'm usually a morning person if I'm like hey there's a task I can get done right now at 11 30 p.m as I'm trying to go to bed awesome let's go like, I'll do it. I'll do it. And then I sleep in a little bit later that day. I try to stay consistent, getting up earlier. But it's just consistency and just loving what you're doing. Like, for me, I love my businesses. I love real estate. What it's allowed me to do in my life. And, like, I found God through it all during the hard times. And it's, like, step one, Christian, like Christian said, find God. Step two, it's, like, I know everybody says it, but your why, it has to be big enough. If your why is just, hey, I don't want to work anymore. Or if I, whatever, if I just want to go travel the world and do crazy stuff, like, cool, is that going to get you through the days when you don't want to roll out of bed? If it's not, then it's probably not a big enough why. Love it. Um, there is a good one here, and I can answer both here um, in, in one shot. So Mason asks, what is your why behind everything you do? Zero then asks right after that. Also, how do you avoid burnout? Well, your why is how you avoid burnout. For me, it started with I wanted to retire my wife from teaching. She got injured. Uh, Our politics in Washington State were not congruent with our personal beliefs. And um, it got really wild during COVID. So we came up with a path of, hey, my my thing that I want to do someday got a defined timeline. I think uh, for all all 21 people who follow me on on X, by the way, uh, Christian Osgood, follow me there. (laughs) <laughs> my last post was, hey, you don't have a time problem. You have a deadline problem. If When you set a deadline and there's an actual timeline on your goals and your goal matters, you just hit it. It's it's what happens. Caleb and I were working on a business pro- a problem earlier this week. And it's something that we've been going through of like, okay, how do we fix this? This is to do with the growing multifamily strategy. How do we fix this problem? And we've been working on it for a few weeks. And I just said, Yesterday, I was like, okay, by the end of this week, we're going to finish it. Caleb and I got everything sorted and figured out. Uh, and we pretty much figured out today. We have one of 10 steps left. We got nine tenths done with our problem in one day because we put a one week timeline on it. I said, I'm going to retire my wife in two years. And 11 months later, we made it. That's, I think that's the difference is you have a why that is important enough to you. And then you go knock it out of the park. My next big one. I want to go debt free for two reasons. One, the goal has always been lever up and then pay it all off. Two, I've never seen anyone actually do it. I hear people talk about it. I've never actually watched anyone online lever up, stabilize, optimize, and pay off the debt. I've met people who have done the full cycle, but they never shared the story. I actually want to, 
I preach this all the time. This is the path to stable financial freedom is paid off real estate. I'm going to go do that. You, I, you guys will watch if it comes together, the trade of a 24 plex for a paid off eight plex, but I will move my pieces around and trade and sell and do what we need to in the portfolio, stabilize, optimize, save up the cash flow. Over the next, I, I'm targeting by 40 years old, I will have paid off my entire current portfolio. I'll have 200 paid off units. I will have paid off my house. I will owe nothing on my cars. That's that's where I'm going in the next eight years. And that is a goal for me that has been a lifelong goal that I'm going to hit. And it means a lot to me. And what it does is I think this shows because I have a public channel that this does work. And you can have a large paid off debt-free portfolio in way less time than it would take you to go through a full traditional career, go to college, get a job. I'm going to prove that online. That means something to me. And so I'm going to hit it. And I said eight years. So now it's going to happen faster. Caleb, what's your why now at this point? I mean, a big thing is just kind of scaling up, creating generational wealth. I mean, just giving people like future family a life I could never have imagined. At the same time, I think on side of that, like outside of the why question, because the why is a very like, big answer for everyone, including myself. But at the same time, you have to not let yourself quit. You have to hold yourself accountable. It's like when times get rough, if you're like, I bow out and you just figure out a way of all your problems and you're just left with nothing. It's like, what was the point? When times mm -hmm. get tough, I mean, there's always a way out. If you look at people who've done it before us, like, I mean, there's people that had billions before either of us were alive and people have done things we can't even imagine before we were alive in business. At the same time, it's like, they did it. There's people have been in pinches far bigger than anything we could ever imagine. Like, don't let yourself quit. Think of a creative solution out of it. But keeping yourself disciplined and honest. Like, there's gonna be times. I mean, I didn't get a deal until nine months in. It's like there were days I wanted to quit. Like, I was just like, this isn't gonna happen. I'm gonna figure it out eventually. Here I am today with the life I couldn't have imagined just because I kept going. So it's just holding yourself accountable, staying disciplined to your why, and keep just following the path. That's a good one. Caleb, if you were starting over again in real estate, what would you do differently? I, go I, have, an idea for you. I have an idea for you, but I'm going to see if you share the same one. What would yeah, you do? Yeah, it's the hyper local day one, not spread out all across the state of Texas. I just buy in the same market every single deal. If I had five deals in Seamville right now, it'd be, I'd much prefer that than where I'm currently at. But that comes back to not letting yourself quit. It's like, oh, I wish I could have done it differently. It's not perfect how I wanted it. It's like, so what? Cool. Just keep going nothing's going to be perfect in business. You're going to learn more as you do every single day. I've learned more in business these last two years than I have in the previous 18 years of my life. There we go. If I was, if I was Caleb, I'd also have had less partners initially. You had a few deals that had a yep. lot of people. Yep. I'm uh, it's, That's a current project working on right now. So. And, and that, and that goes out to everyone. Cause I've seen people go like, okay, it's, it, People get the mindset of, hey, it's going to be easier to raise $50,000 from six people than it is $300,000 from one. It's so untrue. But like people with yeah. a lot of money aren't weird about money. And that just comes down to that. And also, it's like a big misconception. If we're piggybacking mm -hmm. off this of uh, mm -hmm. doing things differently, a common misconception a lot of people have bigger pockets pushes a ton. I love bigger pockets, been on them before too. It's you don't need to have a full team when you're getting started whatsoever you don't need to like oh your lawyer your accountant it's like what do you need a lawyer for what do you need an accountant for if you don't have a deal what do you yep. need a property management for if you don't have a deal that doesn't matter you don't need a partner that's actually if you want to put Jainer's question on the screen right now um, that just came in how do you select the right partner for you you don't need to you don't need a partner when you're going into business day one you're yep. going to find the right partner based on your needs as you continue to scale your business like certain businesses like for me, it's like eventually I want to do a marketing thing. It's like when that time comes, then I'll find the right marketing partner or I'll find the right marketing business. But right now, that's not something I need to worry about. Yeah, you don't need to select the right partner. You don't need a partner right now. You need to get started and take action. And then once you know what you're looking for exactly, you look for someone who fits those needs. If you're like, hey, I'm great on acquisition. I'm looking for someone to take the property management half of my portfolio and I want to keep it in-house. You're looking for an operator. If you're mm -hmm. an operator and you can't do acquisition and you suck at it, that's a, that's a mental thing, first of all. You're looking for an acquisitions guy. It doesn't mean you go 50-50 on absolutely everything in your life. No. You <laughs> sign partners for the roles you're looking for. You're not looking for a partner up front. Yes. We should go the broker route to find your first deal and then go hyper-local from that market. 
This is for you. Well, I, well, that's a great question. I mean, I wish I, I definitely like the owner route more. I don't talk to many brokers anymore. I have a few friends that are agents, but that's really about it. Um, but I definitely am extremely grateful for the phone experience. I mean, a thousand phone calls to uh, brokers kind of trying, trying to weed out if you're a joke or not. Yeah. Help the, the confidence over the phone a lot helped with just not talking too much over the phone a lot too. So I'm on the phone and Christian's a broker and I'm talking my butt off. You're probably like, this dude's not professional. If I'm on the phone saying like, just answering the questions he gives me, it's like, okay, this guy knows his stuff, all this stuff. That's kind of where I got to. So the broker calls were extremely valuable for confidence, learning how to talk to people, learning the lingo of the industry. But at the same time, I would just got owner calls in my market. That just 10 out of 10 times. I think I would have had, I think I'd have 150 units by now if I just the owner calls. I, I agree. And the funny thing is, you never you never play a perfect game. So no matter no matter how you do it, you always learn something new or or whatever. But I, I think the broker calls, especially when you're out of state, brokers are just gonna be a larger part of getting your first deal than the owners. And then once you're you know established in the state, it gets a lot easier. For those who are investing out of market, when you do the owner meetings, just book a bunch of them at the same time. Make sure it's worth the flight. So for the drive, I would do, I would find a couple of deals to look at with a broker. And then when I'm in town, I'd meet a couple of the owners saying, Hey, I'm looking at a couple of deals. Uh, I'm going to be in town. That's a great reason to get coffee is, Hey, I'm flying in. I want to meet some of the other players here. I'm, I'm actually looking at two different deals that I may acquire, um, but would love to get coffee with you guys. I think it'd be super easy. Yeah. How same, do you go same about as a regular, I was going to say same as a regular deal. How do you give a broker commission? Um, yeah. You negotiate it. There's some it. deals where you're you're gonna pay commission. Like the seller's like, hey, negotiate and you pay commission. Okay, you pay commission. Typically but generally the speaking, the, the seller is gonna pay commission uh, on a on a especially on a listed property. They have a they have an agreement with the broker and the broker gets paid. It's there's no differences not, in seller finance. It's not rocket science. Like I understand like Jayner is like trying to think far ahead, and I love that. I love thinking three steps ahead, but that third step doesn't matter down the road until you take step one. At the end of the day, it's, you don't have to worry about who's paying commission. You don't have to worry about a team. You don't have to worry about a partner until you have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And opportunity doesn't matter until how you learn to find an opportunity. If you have no idea what you're doing, you're just trying to get started. I'm not, I'm not saying that's him or not, or he or she, whoever. I'm not saying that's any of you guys on here. But the first thing is just learning how to do it. And then once you have an opportunity, it's deal debt equity. It's not a stupid algorithm, but it's a stupid, simple algorithm that it's like, you're like, oh, it's really that easy. It is that easy. I like when I found this deal, 26 units, put it in a contract, wasn't going to sell or finance it. I can't qualify for a bank loan for one point, whatever million dollars. Then it's like, okay, time to find a capital partner, hit the phones, time to find which bank I'm using, hit the phones mm -hmm. and all this stuff. It's like, then you find it out. And that's about the time that I have for this day. I just wanted to spend some time talking business, talking the sale, talking clothes. Um, Caleb, uh, Caleb's channel, by the way, um, and, and I participate on this one as, as well, is the uh, the Business Brotherhood. Talking business, talking sales. Caleb's workshop in the name with me, but uh, that's where we're at so far. We'll answer one more question that just came in, and then we will go ahead and call this an evening. If you were out of state from the market that you want to be hyperlocal in, how would you tackle getting your first deal? Call an owner. Look on Google Maps, look for the roof, call an owner. If you want to buy multifamily, you're looking for multifamily. If you want to buy storage, you're looking for storage. If you want to buy retail, you're looking for retail. It's a simple game. It's not complicated. I'm calling the owners. I'm probably mixing in a few brokers in there too, Mason. Um, but first, it comes down to learning how. You got to learn how to underwrite a deal because if a like, broker's like, hey, I've got an opportunity for you, you're like, oh, crap. What am I looking for? If you don't know what you're looking for, it doesn't matter. So, mm -hmm. Learning how first, then calling owners and maybe a broker or two. Yep. Uh, call is tomorrow, by the way, uh, for those on the mentorship call or those who are going to sign up today. Um, it's uh, 4 p.m. PST, so CST, that would be 6 p.m. Uh, that'll be the Monday call. Cody Davis will be running that one because I will be in the air headed to Atlanta, Georgia, to be speaking down there on the 27th, which I'm very, very excited for. Um, but awesome. we'll have uh, we'll have Cody Davis in the house running the general questions. And uh, yeah, other than that, business as usual. If anyone has any questions, additionally, feel free to shoot me a DM at Christian Osgood. Caleb, if people want to find you to ask more questions outside of your channel, which this is also being streamed to, the Business Brotherhood, uh, where would people find you? I am on Instagram at Caleb.homel. That is the absolute easiest way to reach me. 
All right. Instagram at Caleb dot Hommel. Anyone can find me at Christian Osgood on multifamilystrategy.com or multifamily on YouTube links here on the bottom of the screen. Other than that, that is a wrap. This was an episode. If you guys want more live content, multifamily strategy goes live every single Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. See you there.